Good evening and welcome. I'm Arian Mack, Professor of Psychology here at the New School for Social Research and longtime editor of our journal Social Research, which was started in 1934 uh, by the then university and exile professors. Welcome to the New School and to the ninth in our Public Voices series from the Center for Public Scholarship. The Public Voices series, which we began in 2012, provides a platform for distinguished public figures and scholars to address the pressing issues of the day. We have been very fortunate to have such distinguished speakers as Russ Feingold, Steven Pinker, Robert J. Lifton, Nicholas Everstadt, William Galston, Barney Frank, James Banford, and Naomi Oreskes. We are very lucky tonight to have as the speaker in our Public Voices ser series, professor who is a, the university in exile, professor in residence at the New School, Professor Xu Yu Yu. Did I do it right? No. <laughs> <laughs> who comes to us from China where he is a professor of Western philosophy at the Chinese Academy of Social Science in Beijing and one of China's leading spokespersons for constitutional democracy. He is an expert on the Chinese Cultural Revolution and the author of 20 books, which is uh, astonishing. His understanding of the cu Cultural Revolution can be found in his book, Rebels of All Stripes, A Study of Red Guard Mentalities in the Chinese Cultural Revolution, published in 1999, and in his own biography of the period, Eventful Years. His outspoken defense of liberalism can be seen in works such as Discourse of Freedom, also published in 99, Facing History in 2000, and Unremitting Spiritual Pursuit in 2002, which have won him a wide following in China and established a sharp contrast between his views and those sponsored by the party. He has been a visiting scholar at Harvard and at Oxford and served as the Olaf Palma visiting professor in Sweden. And in 2014, won the, uh, the Olaf Palma Prize. Professor Xu is our fifth university in exile, scholar in residence at the New School. The New School's engagement with endangered scholars has a long history, beginning with the establishment of the university in exile in 1933 as an academic home for German endangered, primarily German endangered scholars brought to the New School by its first president. We, that is social research and me personally, have had an active engagement with this, uh, with the with the uh, issue of endangered scholars, particularly since 2007, which was sparked by the twice deeply unjust imprisonment in Iran of my colleague and friend Kian Tajbash. First in 2007, he was spent more than a little time in Avon prison, and then much longer in 2009. His imprisonment led me to add a new section to our journal, Social Research, entitled Endangered Scholars Worldwide, which alerts our readers to the plight of imprisoned and threatened scholars around the world and tries to raise public awareness and support for intellectuals, academics, researchers, and students who are being threatened, silenced, or imprisoned for simply doing their scholarly work or speaking out against the injustices around them. I urge you to visit our wonderful Endangered Scholar website, uh, actually created by uh, Evie Sharifi, who is videoing this event, which is constantly updated and provides a way to learn about endangered scholars and provides a way of protesting their persecution. In 2008, building on the energy generated by endangered scholars worldwide, and in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the University in Exile, we established a University in Exile Scholar in Residence Fellowship, generously funded by one of our most cherished and generous members of the New School's Board of Trustees. This one two-year 
Fellowship provides an endangered scholar with a safe academic home in the United States at the New School. And it is a collaboration between the New School and the Scholar Rescue Fund. We are fortunate uh, this evening. Liz, is Liz around? Do you have uh, my version? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's his glasses. I'm getting. I don't think it has shoes stuff in here. Oh, I guess not. We, I get it. Okay, never mind. Okay, we're good. Sorry. Sorry about that. I was a false alarm. Okay, in addition to Professor Shu, we are fortunate this evening to have as our discussant Andrew Nathan, who will serve as the commentator on Professor Shu's paper. Professor Nathan is class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia and world-renowned expert on China. He is the author and co-author of, I think I counted correctly, 15 books and articles too many to count, many of them about China and contemporary China. He was a chair of the Advisory Committee of Human Rights Watch Asia from 1995 to 2000 and continues to serve on the board of Human Rights Watch China. It is now my great pleasure to turn the microphone over to our distinguished speaker, Professor Xu. Thank you, Mac. Thank you for your introduction. I would like to thank and Professor Nancy as thank you Andy thank you for joining our discussion Twenty sixteen makes the fiftieth anniversary of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. It is generally believed that the Cultural Revolution broke out on May 16, 1966. Because on this day, the Chinese Communist Party issued a notification to carry out the Cultural Revolution, in which Mao Zedong sent out an order to attack the inner party bourgeoisie. I am glad to have the opportunity to talk about the Cultural Revolution in the United States at in New York. This topic has been a taboo in mainland China for 30 years. I want to talk about the Cultural Revolution, for I am a researcher of it. In addition, I was a witness of the Cultural Revolution at a head of mass organization. On November 10th, 1966, on Tiananmen Square, I was a parade viewed by Chairman Mao with other 1.5 million students. I spent a hard time in the countryside as a member of the 17 million stu educated students. At first, let us see what the Cultural Revolution was and what it was not. Some people say that the Cultural Revolution is a catastrophe because many people died more were injured and much more injustice aggrieved during the Cultural Revolution. Others say that the Cultural Revolution was a grand festival of the people, for the Chinese enjoyed the freedom of speech and the freedom of association and the right to criticize the privileged class temporarily permitted in the Cultural Revolution. I am in favor of the former point of view. Below, I briefly listed 10 major events to exemplify what happened during the Cultural Revolution. The first is 
abolition of the college interest examination, the central government ordered to abolish the college interest examination to let the college and high school students stop class and make revolution in June 1966. The college interest examination has not been resumed until the end of 1977. The right is a notification of the central government. The left is a story about the Chinese university during the Cultural Revolution. The name is university. The textbook was from middle school. The student from the primary school. The qualification of interest of university is your experience of your manual labor. The second is a mass criticism of public accusation meeting. The student at so-called revolutionary masses condemned and humiliated teachers, principals, scholars, artists, writers, actors, and officials who were labeled counter-revolutionary revisionists as a traditional class enemy such as landlords at rich peasants as rightists was persecuted more severely. This one is a state president, Liu Shaoqi. He was around it and attacked by the so-called revolutionary masses. He died in 1969. That one is his wife. Wang Guangmei, the first lady of China. She was uh, attacked and uh, humiliated by the University of Tsinghua University. He was accused as a spy of CIA. This is a General Luo Shuiqin, former chief of staff of the Liberation Army. He was pulled out to the struggle meeting with his broken neck. This was Mr. Xi Zhongxun, Xi Jinping's father. The third is personality cult. Mao Zedong is said to be a great teacher, great leader, great commander, and a great hairman, man. At every sentence Mao says is truth. At one sentence works as a 10,000 sentence. What Mao said was more effective than the constitution at law. Chairman Mao's quotations were translated into 50 languages. At the total print amount reached 5 billion copies. The fourth is so-called destruction of the four olds namely the old ideas, culture, customs, and habits. Historical relics and artifacts were destroyed. Temples, churches, mosques, monasteries, and cemeteries were van vandalized. Books in library were burned. Nandanod and other class enemy were expelled away from Beijing, Shanghai, and other big cities. Here is a set of incomplete statistics indicating what the Red Guards did in Beijing City in August 1966. Over 1,700 people were killed. More than 30,000 households were ransacked. 520,000 private house property was confiscated. Nearly 100,000 people were expelled from Beijing city. The fifth is a theory of the bloodline, according to which any, young, any youth was 
identified by his or her family background, the children of senior officials mistreated and insulted their schoolmates with blank family background, deprived them of rights of attend movement. The right is a slogan of the theory of bloodline. It's saying, if, if father is a revolutionary, the son must be many fellow. If the father was, uh, is a reactionary, the son must be bastard. The left is Enoch, the young work. He writes a series article to argue with the uh, theory of bloodline. The middle is his article on the family background. The sex is a great limp, link up, great link up. Any high school, any high school student or the university students could go wherever they want to go to exchange ex revolutionary experiences from the summer of the 1966, encouraged and financed by the government. Over 10 million students enjoy the free travel, and most of them traveled to Beijing and accept Mao Zedong's review. It can be imagined how terrible the traffic and production conditions were, were at that time. The seventh is the so-called modern drama. During the Cultural Revolution, 100 million Chinese people could watch only eight so-called revolutionary modern drama. Each of these, these eight was made under the guidance of the provision of Jiang Qin, Mao's wife, who was known as the standard bearer of the Cultural Revolution. The eighth is a setting fire to the British Embassy in Beijing. The Red Guard sanked the British legation in Beijing and carried out an arson attack to the embassy of the August 22, 1967. It's a, it's a British newspaper at that time. The lens is a done to the countryside movement. 17 million middle school students were ordered to go to the rural and mountainous area of some cities from the end of 1968 and to be educated by the poor peasant. The tenth is the Limbiao incident. On September 13th, 1971, Limbiao, his wife, and his son attempted to flee to the Soviet Union, but the plan crashed in Mongolia, killing war on board, according to the official narrative. Ning had already been enshrined into the party constitution as Mao's closest comrade in arm and successor. In Biao incident caused a serious ideological crisis of the Communist Party of China, a bankruptcy of the myth of the Cultural Revolution. The right is a wreckage of the airplane. The Cultural Revolution causes the greatest harm in a total disregard of the rule of law and brutal violations against human rights and human lives. The following is a set of incomplete official statistics. 4.2 million people were illegally detained and interrogated during the Cultural Revolution. 1.22 million died of a natural death. 130,000 was executed on current revolutionary charges. 23,000 deaths and 7, 7 million permanent injury resulted from the armed functional struggle. Now we would ask, 
Why did Mao Zedong launch the Cultural Revolution? There were three answers. The first is that it is the policy differences. Mao Zedong insisted on Marxism upheld justice and equality to realize socialism and communism, whereas his rival implicated capitalist policy. The differentiation between the rich and the poor began to appear in the society of China. Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in order to prevent the restoration of the capitalism in China. The second says that Mao launched the Cultural Revolution motivated by struggle for power. Mao might, in fact, have lost power. It was with the aim of regaining it that he launched the struggle. The third says that Mao launched the Cultural Revolution motivated by both policy differences and struggle for power. In order to seize power, Mao Zedong as the Communist Party of China promised to Chinese people before 1949 that they would carry out the policy different from those of the Soviet Union, and the Socialist Revolution would be far away. This political program was called the New Democracy, under which other political parties would be permitted to share the political power with the Communist Party of China, as a mixed, mixed economy would be implicated, implemented, including market economy. But when seized the power, Mao abandoned the promise of the new democracy and carried on a socialist revolution, whereas Liu Shaoqi kept the promise to consolidate and develop new democracy. For this, Mao decided to cancel Liu Shaoqi's position as the number two in the party as his successor. Mao believed that he would be surely the number one in the world communist movement when Stalin died in 1953. But Mao Zedong faced a huge difficulty that the Soviet Union was economically more advanced and powerful than China. In order to be the world leader, Mao must make China's economy strong. He launched the Great Leap Forward in an attempt to make China's economy stronger than Britain and the Soviet Union, even the United States, in a short time. Unfortunately, the Great Leap Forward ended in defeat. Only because of Liu Shaoqi's leadership and his programmatic policy, China came out from the disaster in the middle of the 1960s. And in the process of restoring the economy, Liu's power was growing with higher and higher reputation. To that, Mao Zedong could not tolerate it. So Mao Zedong decided to start the Cultural Revolution to get rid of Liu Shaoqi. Some people may ask, it was Mao Zedong brought about disaster. It was Liu Shaoqi tightened up the situation while Chinese people support Mao to overthrow Liu. There were two reasons. First, most people didn't understand the real situation. When Mao was embarrassed, facing with criticism, Lin Biao, Mao's faithful follower, stood out and said, the only reason we made mistakes was that we did not act according to the Chairman Mao's instruction. Second, Mao set up a tramp for Liu Shaoqi at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, so that Liu suppressed masses and make them angry. Mao left Beijing in May and June when the movement started and let Liu Shaoqi preside over the work. In accordance with the usual practice of the Communist Party of China, Liu Shaoqi divided the ordinary people into the left, the middle, at the right, 
and turned those people who were not obedient into rights or count revolutionary in every university, high school, and other unit. When the conflict between the masses and Liu Shaoqi reached its peak in the July, Mao suddenly returned to Beijing, accusing Liu Shaoqi of suppression of masses and claiming his support for the broad masses as liberation of those suppressed and labeled as counter-revolutionary. It was not difficult to imagine how grateful to Mao those suppressed and liberated people were at that time, how they hated to Liu Shaoqi. Just as Ximenez said, the way in which Mao mobilized and used the Red Guards is very similar to the way in which the Dojo Empress Cixi Xi manipulated the boxers. He turned against his enemies the mass of popular discontent, which had been brought about by his own regime, and which should have been turned against himself. Having won the battle, put power in his hands, Mao Zedong issued his instruction, now it's a turn for the young students to make mistakes in the summer of 1968. It means that Mao no longer needed the Red Guards as students. Mao decided to take them off the political stage. In August of 1968, Mao sent workers and soldiers to occupy every university. By the end of the 1968, Mao forced millions of the middle school students to go to the countryside from city. After that, he launched campaigns one after another to purge and punish the rebels who had been his faithful followers. Mao's suppression of masses in the later period of movement was far more than Liu Shaoqi's in the early movement. Though it was late, the students still starting to rethink and criticize the cultural revolution as awakened from the worship of Mao. The dissatisfaction with the cultural revolution reached the climax in April 1976, people gathered, gathered in the Tiananmen Square to denounce Mao, Mao's wife and other senior officials who were Mao's henchmen. Someone shouted after the slogan, saying Mao was a contemporary autocratic emperor. Some senior bureaucrats launched the court coup d'etat and arrested Mao's wife after the death of Mao Zedong in October 1976. They were pleasantly surprised to see that the vast majority of Chinese people hate the Cultural Revolution and supported their court coup d'etat. It was a honeymoon period of the Chinese people and the rulers from the end of the 1970s to the beginning of the 1980s. The bureaucrats who lost office and were persecuted in the Cultural Revolution and resumed their position now redressed wrongings down to the ordinary people. Both of them condemned the Cultural Revolution and exposed the atrocity and tragedies that had occurred during the Cultural Revolution. However, the authority soon issued a ban to talk about the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was a disaster to the Chinese people brought about by the Communist Party of China after all. Once the Cultural Revolution was criticized, people naturally would ask, should only Mao Zedong be responsible for it? What is the problem of China's system? From the middle of the 1990s, more and more Chinese people began to talk about the Cultural Revolution provenly. 
even look forward to another cultural revolution because injustice and inequality became more and more intensified. The gap between the rich and the poor became wider and wider in China. People were unable to change this situation. They had to expect to expose and knock down on corrupt officials in the way used in the Cultural Revolution. However, this hope is unrealistic as well as dangerous. It's a consequence of a ban to talk about the Cultural Revolution. After the lapse of 50 years, many Chinese mistakenly think that the Cultural Revolution was a campaign to eliminate corruption and purify the Chinese society. The influence of the Cultural Revolution is profound and complicated. The Cultural Revolution makes China's economy on the brink of the bankruptcy. It proved that the highly centralized planned economy would not work, and that China would be bankrupt and poor without trade with the outside world. In view of this, the Chinese leaders implicated the policy of the reform at open door at market economy from the 1980s. Contrary to Mao Zedong's expectation, the Cultural Revolution promoted the democratic movement of contemporary China in certain sense. One consequence one consequence of the Cultural Revolution is that the independent cons co consciousness of the Chinese people has been greatly enhanced after the Cultural Revolution. An interviewee told me, 800 million Chinese people had only one head during the Cultural Revolution. That means only Mao Zedong was allowed to think but everyone else had to obey. As a result, anything Mao Zedong approved of was said to be right, and anything he disapproved of was said to be wrong. After Mao died, every, everybody realized he had a head on his shoulders and could think for himself. Before the Cultural Revolution, the party was sacred and undoubted, but the Cultural Revolution changed that. Just as Perry Zhang said, the widely exaggerated charges leveled against the highly priest and hitherto trusted party leader in the course of the Cultural Revolution have tarnished the party's image seemingly almost beyond repair. Some students were, were fanatic Maoist, Maoist during the Cultural Revolution, and after the Cultural Revolution, they learned the Western political theories with great enthusiasm, understood the principles such as separation and checks of the powers, human rights, rule of law, constitutional democracy, and so on, which they had despised and criticized. They become the backbone of the contemporary Chinese democracy movement. The, the Cultural Revolution was over 40 years ago, but it has had the influence on the contemporary Chinese politics. In recent years, more and more powers have been concentrated in the hands of one person. Personality cult began to rise. The rule of law was disregarded. So we have reason to fear that China will once again be enveloped by the shadow of the Cultural Revolution. This is a realistic danger, also the reason why I have to do my best to talk about the Cultural Revolution. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I want
want to uh, praise the New School for hosting Professor Xu as the uh, scholar, the, the university in exile scholar. It's wonderful that the New School can do this. Uh, Professor Xu is a very distinguished uh, scholar, both of Western political thought in China and of the history of China, the Cultural Revolution. Uh, he has uh, signed Charter 08. He has pursued investigations into the 1989 crackdown. He's a, a kind of Chinese Diogenes carrying a light and looking for the honest truth. And I've admired him for a long, long time. And it's just a tremendous pleasure under the auspices of the New School to, uh, to have met him. We've already had a couple of seminars. And this event is also, it's a great privilege uh, uh, to be here. Um, he has a sense of responsibility to history that's really admirable. And, um, and I'm thrilled to see such a great turnout for this event. It seems to me that the Cultural Revolution, you know, was a long time ago. It was far away. And uh, I don't think we were sure that, you know, people in New York with the spring happening, May, and, you know, uh, would uh, come out in numbers to hear about it. But it's great that you have come because I think Professor Shu's uh, speech has, has showed you that this was a vast event in the history in history, period, and, and uh, it went on for 10 years. It was incredibly violent. It was incredibly complex. Many, many people were harmed. Um, so it, it really deserves our attention, and you're right to come and hear about it. But this would lead me to my first question, which is that um, although it was a gigantic event, um, it seems to me that among that the Chinese who think about it are a tiny, tiny minority, that China today, it's as if it never happened. You know, you go to China, it's wealthy, it's prosperous, there's the middle class, there's modernization. Um, it's kind of as though it's really been forgotten as much by Chinese people as, or more, by Chinese people than by us. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about the legacy. In the legacy part of your talk, you mentioned that uh, it, some people became disillusioned, including yourself, and, and have since that time have pursued thinking about democracy. But then you also mentioned that the new leadership is admires Mao and, and is imposing a cult of personality. So has anything changed? Has China learned its lesson? Or has this all been forgotten? Tell us a little bit more about the legacy. The influence and the legacy of the cultural revolution is very, very complicated. It's OK. I, I think it's. <laughs> no problem. I I I can hold. Uh, I say the the legacy of influence of the Cultural Revolution is very complicated. Uh, anyway, first of all, I must say I belong to the minority. I don't want to forgive cultural revolution, but by overwhelming majority of Chinese people, they forget it. Or more exactly speaking, not forget. He never knows this. He's ignorant about it. Of course, it's not the fault of Chinese people. It's a result of the ban issued by Communist Party of China don't talk about cultural revolution. So we cannot publish any articles, any books in China. Well, all my works and thesis published overseas in the United States or in Hong Kong or in, tai in Taiwan. Mm. 
the attitude of Chinese people towards to culture is very diversity. Mm, some people, some intellectuals just like me, we emphasize we must remember the lesson. We, jo we must draw enough lesson from the Cultural Revolution, from this tragedy, from this disaster. Uh, but the, the attitude is have a change like the you turn you see uh, just end just after end of the cultural revolution people accused cultural revolution most people accused it because they re revividly remember the suffering of, from the cultural revolution but from the from either of the 1990s, people, uh, their attitude gradually changed because the uh, social injustice and uh, inequality became more and more serious. People, they mistakenly think the Cultural Revolution is a great campaign against uh, the corruption or to attack the inner party uh, bourgeoisie or some, some pre privileged class. So they, they want to, they expect another cultural revolution because they disappointed to, uh, towards the, today's policy of the anti-corruption. So different people might draw different lessons. You mentioned the lesson of the cultural revolution. Yes. So I would think, for example, Deng Xiaoping's lesson perhaps was um, we have to have collective leadership. We have to have, uh, we cannot have lifetime terms in office. We have to institutionalize the party so that it is regularized. That might be his lesson. Um, maybe somebody else's lesson, I don't, maybe Xi Jinping or somebody else's lesson might be, we must never have democracy. We cannot trust the masses. And then some other people's lesson might be, politics is too dangerous. We should only uh, make money and spend money. Yeah. You know, different people's lessons. Would you say that's true, that different people have drawn different? Yes, yes. I, I think the most important, interesting is the way Draw a, a, a lesson from cultural revolution is Deng Xiaoping's attitude. Hmm. You see, I think the most uh, great and uh, important draw from the cultural revolution is the uh, market economy. It get, get this conclusion Deng Xiaoping from the culture, cultural revolution. I think it's a very positive, it's a very, very great idea about it. But on the other hand, you see, when the, when the June 4th massacre happened in 1989, Deng Xiaoping remember cultural revolution. The McFarquhar said the article to, to, say, to discuss this very clearly and correctly. When the young, young student gathered in Tiananmen Square, there is a vivid picture in, in Deng Xiaoping's mind. So at home, Deng Xiaoping said, the Cultural Revolution come again. So they think, the, the student, just like the picture, uh, uh, Chairman Liu, Liu Shaoqi was uh, attacked by the so-called revolutionary masses and rebel students. Deng Xiaoping thought at that time, it's uh, just a moment, maybe the, the, the students were bumped into he, his home and give him the struggle meeting for him. So he very nervous of, of it. And he said, he, his evaluation to the um, student democratic movement said, it's uh, some, some rebels in cultural revolution behi in the behind of the, the young students mm -hmm. in the June 4th. So Deng Xiaoping draw a positive Nathan, a negative lesson from the Cultural Revolution. He, in, in fact, among the Chinese top leaders, Deng Xiaoping is uh, such a person pay 
great attention to the Cultural Revolution. Because he suffered from it. Yes, yes, exactly. So you were uh, a, one of the leaders of one of the rebel groups when you yeah. were um, middle school, right? Uh, yes, you yes. were 14 years old? How old? Uh, 19, just graduated Nine, 19. from high school. I uh, uh -huh. was going to attend some uh, interest examination of, for university. And it was canceled. Uh, yes. And this was in Chengdu in Sichuan. In Chengdu number one middle school. At that time, we are very happy, very excited. Oh, it's a revolutionary time at last coming. <laughs> we have an opportunity to make a revolution. But after several day, years, we think it's uh, very bad. We lost the opportunity to study in university. So I wonder if you could tell a little bit about when you first uh, began to reevaluate the Cultural Revolution. You say it was a couple of years later, or how soon did you begin to th be critical of it? Maybe when I was forced to go to countryside, I, you see, before I went to go to countryside, I have uh, some, from our political lessons, we say the, the system of China is the best one in the world. The socialist system is uh, very good. The Chinese people was the happiest people in the world. But when we go to the countryside, we were surprised so bankrupt, so much poverty. I surprised why excellent political system make such a situation. So I began to think and think about about it. And at that time, so then you were twenty one years old or so. Uh, yes, and what, what was your diagnosis? What did you think was the problem then? You see, I think the most important is not what I think. Chairman Mao ordered us go to the countryside to receive the re-education from poor peasants. But the poor peasants, including the party secretary, told me we lived much better when we work for Nandanot. It's a very <laughs> strange. So I must face the reality. And what, what, was the f f what was wrong? What was the fault of this? Who, who did you blame? Or how, what did you think needed to be fixed? Did the you blame Chairman Mao? Did you blame the party? Did you blame socialism? Did you blame the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the, the, the first person who should be responsible for it is Chairman Mao. And you thought that then? Yes, because I saw him personally in Tiananmen Square. And we do everything almost directly from Chairman Mao. Mm -hmm. So I think Mao, Chairman Mao should be responsible for it. So after Mao died, there was a period of Enlightenment movement that you participated in. So from like 1978, 79, in that period, there was a lot of discussion by the yes. intellectuals. Yes, yes. Uh, what, what was your, th your thinking at that time? I know there were different theories of different people at that time about China's history. I think, in fact, I rethink the, the politics of China very early, or maybe from the beginning of the 1970s. So after Mao died, I think my, my mind is much more beyond the ordinary Chinese people. Mm -hmm. uh, I criticize the basic uh, Basic system, political social system. I criticize very sharply to Mao, Mao Zedong as the regime of Communist Party of China. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I remember when Mao Zedong, when the news of Mao Zedong Mao Zedong's death come here, a lot of Chinese people they are very painful. 
really, they cried. But I and my wife, we are very, very glad. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, <clears throat> we definitely clearly said at last, Mao did a uh, only right thing. He died in time. <laughs> uh, so we have an opportunity to live uh, another life uh, once again. Uh, we mean maybe we have, a, we have an opportunity to go to the university. Mm. So we want to go to university very much. Um, when you, in your slides, you talked about two theories why Mao launched the Cultural Revolution. One was the policy disagreement. The other one was a power struggle. And you said both are true. So on the policy disagreement, um, my understanding is that at the root of this policy, the most, they disagreed about a lot of policies, yeah. agricultural policy, industry, education. But at the basis of these disagreements was a different view about human nature where Liu Xiaoqi, Deng Xiaoping were pragmatic and they thought human nature is, is uh, utilitarian in some way and we have to produce incentives for people. And Mao thought that human nature could be revolutionized, that you could create a new man. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Um, do, uh, do you agree with what I just said or am I misunderstanding Mao? No, you are correct, but it's an uh, Anthony thought, not on the reality levels. In fact, Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, is they are very pragmatic. Yeah. They never talk about the philosophy. So on the reality, uh, realistic level, uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping pay much more attention to the economic problem. Mm. Mao Zedong like, like to talk uh, philosophy or something very complicated, very confused. <laughs> Do you think he really believed that human nature could be remade by virtue of revolution? I think Mao had such an uh, ambition to change the human nature. I, I, I think so. Uh -huh. yes. To make people sacrifice themselves to make them into sort of lay feng people who would serve society, obey? Yes, there is a very famous saying by Chairman Mao during the Cultural Revolution. Mao Zedong's original saying is like this. I approve such a slogan. First, don't care death. Bupas. Second, don't care of hardship. Uh, yes, <laughs> on, on the other uh, occasion, Mao Zedong said, I feel very, very strange. Why people like money so much? He himself he, never used he money. He never touched <laughs> money. He didn't need to. Uh, uh, <laughs> for for very, very long time, uh, a lot of Chinese people, including me, think it's a merit, it's a strong point for Chairman Mao because they never touch money. But at last, I realize it's a very bad thing. If a politician, if the Chinese top leader, they, they never know about the money. They must never know the uh, economic uh, problem. They, they never concern the hardship or suffering from the very common people. So it's a problem, it's not a strong point. So, but you're giving Mao credit in a way, you're praising Mao for being a person who had a, an ideal, a revolutionary ideal that you say he really believed in, is that right? He wasn't just using this idea to trick people, he believed in it. In fact, I. In fact, Mao is a so complicated person. In, on the one hand, he, he likes he like to talk about the philosophy, some, some <laughs> social idea or something very beyond the reality. But some things, we have some pragmatic idea. I can take an example. At the beginning of the 90s, 
the over 30 million Chinese people died of hunger. It's a very great tragedy. But at that time, Mao talked a lot of philosophy. He says the Marxist, the dialectic, he think the to live and to die is not, uh, at first it's a different thing, but in <laughs> fact it's the same thing. <laughs> is this die, a Marxist die, idea or is it a Buddhist yeah. idea? I think it's a deep Chinese Mao's idea. <laughs> he, he think the death and the live is can shift each other. Dialectics. In fact, he only wants to justify his policy yeah. because his policy caused the so many people died. Mm. So when he talk about the philosophy, at first we think, oh, it's a great person. But at last, I think it's a very bad person. He talked a lot about philosophy only to justify his failure. A lot of people are, you showed pictures of the violence of the Cultural Revolution, and people are often puzzled about how, and it's not only China, you know, it's the Holocaust, it's, you know, Cambodia, it's Sudan, it's <laughs> episodes in American history, but people still struggle with this. How, uh, for example, young students can, can beat to death their teachers uh, and um, this cruelty, where does that come from? So there's a lot of theories that the cruelty was, uh, that, that um, you had to beat up or else you would be beaten up, or that people were motivated by, uh, they, they, they were trained that that person is a class enemy who's not a human being. What's your understand? And we we talked in an earlier seminar. We've had a couple of seminars that Professor Xu, although he was in one of the revolutionary movements, he was more of a theory person in that particular organization, and he didn't participate in the beatings. But but you saw that happening. Where does that violence come from? Is it some people say this is Chinese? culture or something like that, or the Chinese character, which is a conclusion I would not like to draw. But where do you think the violence came from? I think that came from the leadership of Chairman Mao and his faithful follower. Mm. I think it is Chairman Mao should responsible for it. You see, it's very, it's beyond your imagination. It's totally ridiculous. Chairman Mao said, we, we have not experienced a war for over 10 years. So we must have some armed struggle, have some war. At the beginning of the 1960, 1967, at the beginning of this, at the new year, he said, we must Congratulations for this, in this year, we have uh, all around armed struggle. And he, on some document, he ordered Lin Biao to give weapons to the mass organization. It's very strange because every mass organization support him, but he, he ordered Lin Biao to send some, weapon to this school, not another school, to wipe, to in, to wipe out the, this mass organization. It's very ri ri ridiculous. We have trouble uh, with people like Mao, like uh, the Kim family, Hitler, Stalin, and so forth, kind of separating out the great man theory that this is his he made everything happen, and it's, it all came from his personality with this sort of sociological analysis that there are structures and forces in society. What's your view on that as a historian? Is it, is it, is it all coming from Mao, and he loved struggle, and he wanted to remake human beings, and he, how could he make, China today is 1.4, billion people, but then it was a mere, I guess, 800 million. 
How, how can one person make 800 million people do crazy things that are in his mind? In fact, uh, unfortunately, before uh, the Durian Cultural Revolution, Mao enjoyed very, very high prestige. People only blind follow him. Whatever he says is the truth. We only obey, obey him. We never think about whether wrong or right, Mao's direction. Never thought about it. But even um, when you were sent down to the countryside, you began to doubt this. Well, we, we, we cultural, began to doubt this. You began to doubt, but the Cultural Revolution continued on, you know, for another, what, how many, another eight years or something like that? I think maybe from the mid of 1968, we almost, <coughs> majority of the Chinese students, including university and middle school students, began to rethink what we had done. And we think whether or not Chairman Mao's direction is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. It's such a complicated topic, and uh, there are so many great questions. And I think we can go to Q&A from the audience. And we have two mics, one on that side. Oh, are we going to, oh, no, we're going to travel the mics around, I think. OK, so there are some people who have mics, and they will bring them to you. Yeah. OK, so let's, oh, oh you, you yeah. got a mic. OK. OK, my name is Raymond Lada. I direct uh, the thisiscommunism.org website, which projects the truth about communist revolution in the 20th century. Now, I just want to say that what we've heard is just warmed over recycled anti-communist distortion. In fact, the Cultural Revolution was the most far-reaching attempt in human history to revolutionize and restructure society away from exploitation and oppression. And it was a profound upheaval that involved hundreds of millions of people in struggle over the direction of society. Right. Would it keep, go keep forward it. to communism, to a world community of humanity, without class division, or back? To, keep, keep or it. back to capitalism, which is the China yeah. of today, of keep sweatshops of environmental destruction and sex work. Now, my question is, why has the professor denied the coherent aims and objectives of this revolution? That is, it was aimed at overthrowing new capitalist forces, at reshaping the institutions of society, promoting socialist values. And why has the professor completely obliterated the accomplishments of the Cultural Revolution. Look, okay, that's middle school enrollment Ray, expanded quick. from 15 Ray, million Ray, to Ray, 65 Ray, million Ray, 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 be quiet. Let's ask the question. I want to get, I want to find out your website. Thank you. Just tell us your website again. I want to hear that. But that's all. Okay. The, Thank you. So, Tasha, and what is your political party? I just want to explain to him. I promote the perspectives of the Revolutionary Communist Party. I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking. Yeah. I promote the perspectives of the Revolutionary Communist Party and the new synthesis of communism of Bob Bacon. Okay. Built on the Cultural Revolution, and which represents okay. the Thank you. All right, good enough, good enough, good enough. Okay. Tasha May Guadi Ega Gong Chan Ega Gong Chan Dang the Ega Dai Bia. May Guadi Chin Mao. Just a sort of Ju Ju Chu Wen Hua Da Gaming. Thank you. I think, I think it's, it's, I'm glad you spoke. It's very interesting and it's good for Professor Xu to know about you. So I just want to briefly explain. Megwayo I criticize and accuse cultural revolution from my 
personal experience. I think it's much more important than any propaganda, any theory, any Uh, <laughs> any editorial board, board from the people's daily or from flanks. I, I think the much more important is my experience. I suffer suffering a lot. As I, I know a lot of Chinese people suffering greatly from the Cultural Revolution. So we cannot judge, uh, uh, give evaluation to the Cultural Revolution from a theory. We cannot live in the imag imagination or some unrealistic versions. Okay, uh, let's get somebody here over on this side. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Moore. First of all, it's a great relief to me to know that my Chinese friends who were harmed by the Cultural Revolution deserved to be harmed. I, I feel much better about that. Um, the second, <laughs> okay. thing, second thing is, in, this is an educational question. Uh, you've hinted that uh, cultural revolutions of one shade or another have been numerous around the world. You know, the French Revolution comes to mind along with several other 20th century events. Um, is there a way to educate the, if you will, the, the struggling or would-be struggling masses about the possible ways to conduct their great proletarian revolutions, if that's what they want to do, so that they can kind of see certain things coming? Could there be cultural revolution the summer camp for American youth so that they could kind of get the idea of, well, you agree with us, but you don't agree with us just right, so we're going to throw rocks at you. You mean a better way to do it? Yeah, kind of, yeah I mean, no, not a better way to do it, just a, 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 a sampling of, of what things could be like if they got out of hand. Uh, this, this, the, be careful, oh. sort, sort of a be careful what you wish for moment. Oh, I see. Uh, some funny. I don't. I'm not sure. I completely understand the question, but you're saying to use this history to tell the teenagers to stop making trouble. I have a teenager too. <laughs> okay. Tarenway Thank you very much, and thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, this is kind of a difficult situation because on the, on the one side, we have a very uh, critical view of the Cultural Revolution, which is, you know, supported by many facts and is indisputable, right? On the other side, we have, uh, you know, somebody which represents what it's so-called communism and, uh, you know, has clearly demonstrated uh, himself to be uh, sort of slightly fanatical, which is, you know, fine or whatever, but... You know, and that leaves the youth today, like people like me, in a difficult situation. You know, as a as a young communist, I've been imprisoned in various like student struggles. Uh, I come from Scotland. I, you know, was imprisoned in London for various like student demonstrations. And uh, I think like, you know, there has to be a, a way in which we can, uh, you know, see this from not quite both perspectives. Uh, more, like for example, I mean, in China now we have. Uh, you know, the worst workers' rights in the world, right? I mean, you, you can't strike, you're immediately, uh, the police immediately and the army immediately uh, uh, crack down on you very violently. You know, uh, when Mao died, we have seen uh, nothing but capitalism ravish uh, China to the point where we have an extreme level of inequality, regardless of what we think of Mao and all the awful atrocities that were committed during that period the direction in which China's gone has been very, uh, you know, negative. Uh, and the capitalist program that it's adopted has, beco has become essentially an authoritarian form of capitalism, capitalism without the democracy. Right, right. I get where you're going. Right. So is there a middle? Of course. My, my, my question is that, like, you know, my, my question is fundamentally that could there be some sort of valuable lessons that could be learned from the Cultural Revolution, or is it... 
all uh, negative? And also, can we, can we uh, look at it from a perspective of progressive politics today in any way? Tarenway 他自己是新工厂主义 oh, I, I, I can understand what, what, you, what you say I think it's a uh, I think there is no logical relationship between when we criticize the Chinese reality as you I am, I, I am criticizing the Chinese reality very much but we cannot do a conclusion so we must return to cultural revolution. In fact, I don't think the cultural revolution give some our good resolution about it. You uh, take ex uh, example, just like I, I said in my, in my talk, there are over one million political prisoners executed in cultural revolution. So most of Chinese intellectuals get some conclusion from the unsatisfied uh, reality of China, today's China. We must return not to cultural revolution. Maybe we should go to constituting a democracy. It, 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 it would be much better the, the conclusion than to return to the cultural revolution. Why would it be better? At least, I, I, I think under the system of the constitutional democracy, everybody can enjoy freedom of speech. I think it's the most important thing. It's the first mm -hmm. important thing. Uh, but in cultural revolution, we can want, of course, we enjoy the freedom of speech, but this speech only say non chairman Mao. It's freedom of speech, it means nothing. It's not the real freedom of, of, of speech. Is there any reactionary in the audience that I could call? Are you a reactionary? Are you another leftist? All right, get this guy. Are you a liberal? All right. Okay, all right, wait for the mic. I don't need the microphone. Okay, all right. All right, go ahead, no mic. Okay. I teach in my sociology class the cultural revolution. My question is, how do you see the concept of the 100 flowers campaign in the general structure of the cultural revolution when Mao said let 100 flowers bloom, let a million thoughts develop, and the first thing that happened, people got their heads handed to them. But that was before the culture, so you want to know what's... Well, it was still, it was like the beginning so, of it. No, it's a fascinating part of it. Uh, uh, 100 Flowers, Bai Hua, uh, Bai Hua Yundong, 1957年的 Bai Hua, 北华奇饭的 Yundong 跟文化大革命有一个什么关系? 他说当时大家能够说话, 但是后来被打下来了. I don't think there is some direct relationship between the two events. In the team, in 1957, Chairman Mao promised the freedom of speech. He said we will welcome any criticism to the Communist Party of China. But when Chinese intellectuals really realized this criticism, Chairman Mao changed his policy immediately, only one overnight, to suppress the criticizer. Uh, in cultural revolution, it's, uh, the situation is totally different. Chairman Mao lets Chinese young students say what, 
to criticize Chairman Liu Shaoqi or criticize the party organization. But uh, you, you see, in, in the 1977, it's very dangerous to criticize the party organization. So it's not, there is no any common, common point. The person who had the mic before. <laughs> I, I, I didn't come with a, a personal agenda, so I'm, I'm kind of sorry. Um, <laughs> I, really, I really just came to learn. Um, so um, you mentioned now, Professor, um, that um, talk of media around uh, the Cultural Revolution is banned, is what I heard. Um, I'd like to know how attempts to communicate, like um, uh, Zhang Yimou's film To Live, how those attempts to use media to communicate a more even-handed picture of the Cultural Revolution inside China, if that kind of media is, is bubbling up, being suppressed, available. Thank you. Yes. In fact, Zhang Yimou's film not directly concerned with the uh, cultural revolution. So far as I know, different uh, film make have a different attitude. Zhang Yimou, his film is criticized cultural revolution, but indirectly, we cannot directly say say something. You may have better change the leader. Yes, in, in fact, the attitude of Zhang Yimou towards the cultural revolution is criticized. So Zhang Yimou, almost uh, most film made by Zhang Yimou was criticized cultural revolution, but he, the narrative is not directly, only mm -hmm. indirectly. Uh, almost every audience can know it's talk about cultural revolution, but there is no direct episodes about the cultural revolution. Yeah. So there was somebody over, uh, oh, you did, go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Uh, amongst, amongst the scholars who study the cultural uh, revolution, not the common view, but the scholars, what is the biggest misconception people have? Or to put it another way, what is the most critical aspect of history that has been overlooked, in your opinion. Thank you. Literature,就是说，不是说群众，但是学者最对文化大革命最大的误会，最大的懂错的方面是什么？It's—it's very hard to see. You see, different scholars have different opinion. I think the most serious mistakes by historian is the Mao Zedong launched the Cultural Revolution motivated by the anti-capitalism. I don't think it's a correct explanation about the Mao Zedong's motivation about it. I can think the much more important thing is Mao Zedong wants to regaining the power from Liu, Liu Shaoqi, just like I talk. But you say there were policy differences. We admit there is some consideration of the policy differences, but I think it's not the first importance. Hmm. The first important is to power. In fact, Mao Mao can tolerate somebody if they if their policy if his policy is just like familiar with Liu Shaoqi. But I think the the most important thing is be, the difference between the person, not the policy. Was there really a threat to Mao's power or was he paranoid? It's a really sweet you see in in nineteen in, in, at the beginning of the 1960s, there is a very big conference 
in the head by Communist Party of China. Mm. At this, we call this big conference is a 700 people, 7,000 people conference. And this, and this conference headed by Liu Xiaoqi, a lot of Communist Party of people, member criticized Mao Zedong very sharply. Uh, Liu Xiaoqi openly said, um, the cause of our failure is 30% 30, 30 is, is from the bad weather, but 70% is from our policy. It's directly correct to Liu Xiaoqi, Mao Zedong, and Mao was, was very, very embarrassed it. Mm. At, at last, Lin Biao come stood out to save Mao Zedong. He said, uh, the, the only reason we made a mistake is only we cannot act according to Chairman Mao's construction. But um, most people criticize, criticize Mao very harshly. <laughs> I want to go a little beyond the cultural revolution and I have two questions. What is your perspective about the present uh, governing structure or government of China? And uh, uh, what is your vision of uh, democracy that uh, you would like to see over there? Is it the best democracy that money can buy over <laughs> here or some, something else? <laughs> Uh,他说这个不是涉及到文化大革命,但是他要提两个有关联的问题,一个问题是说你对现在的中国政治体制有什么看法,第二个问题是说你要在中国实现的民主是怎么样的民主,是不是钱能够买到就是说美国式的民
there is a very famous saying spread among Chinese ordinary people. We say they are worth uh, 10 days of Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution returned again for only for 10 days. Because the almost every newspaper, every magazine, every propaganda to attack Zheng Ziqiang, only because Zheng Ziqiang said our central TV station cannot be non to party. It's a very, uh, Zheng Ziqiang was numbered as a anti, anti-party element. So almost every newspaper attacks them. It's very like the phenomenon in the Cultural Revolution. So at that time, Chinese people think the Cultural Revolution turned again. But immediately, the attack stopped by the unknown reason. Maybe there is a very complicated inner party struggle. But anyway, at that time, Chinese people generally think the Cultural Revolution returned return back. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, I, I did come here to learn something. And I have to say that I'm not terribly satisfied. So I heard things that I knew already and not, not very much the level of uh, research that I would expect. In any case, I have a very simple question. Why is it that uh, our uh, distinguished speaker did not elaborate on the issue which is fundamental to understand what was going on, and, and on which I suppose as knowledge that we don't have, certainly don't, which is what were the fundamental differences in the policies? Because that's the only thing which matters. What was in fact Mao advocating? And what was in fact the, or his enemies or the other fraction within the party advocating in terms of the development in China at that point? That's the thing which matter, and you have not said anything about it. Well, I, I see, in, in my opinion, uh, factually, Liu Shaoqi was uh, orthodox Marxism, pay a great attention to the economic construction because according to the Marxism, um, economy is the basic, the political structure is the upper structure. So Liu, uh, it's, it's, in, in some sense, Liu is a dogmatic Marxism he wants the first thing for China would be develop e economy. But Mao has a, a totally different idea. Mao said China would be a very powerful country in the world only by big revolution, continuing re re revolution. Mao wants to rely on some political campaign to realize his purpose. But for Liu Shaoqi, China would be realize his great nation's purpose, want to must only by develop the economy. It's a, it's a basic difference. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank the audience for some very challenging <laughs> questions. And thank Professor Xu. Thank you. And I, I think there's a, a reception over there, so you'll be able to uh, ask him some more questions. Okay.